<laughs> as people are sitting. Yes, hello, welcome for, to the last panel of the evening. Uh, this is New Approaches to Nonfiction, Pushing the Form. Um, I'm going to leave like some a, a lot of time for some questions at the end, but I like to remind people about that at the beginning of the panel. So please be thinking of your questions um, as we are talking. Um, I'll just have all of our panelists um, introduce themselves as well as say a little bit about their most recent nonfiction comic project. And, and I'll just start like right next to me and then go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, please. Thank you all. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Brian Box Brown. Um, my book, The He Man Effect How uh, American Toy Makers Sold You Your Childhood, uh, <laughs> uh, came out in July. Uh, and it is a uh, long, long story, but mostly about the deregulation of children's media in the 1980s. Hi, my name is Dan Knott. Uh, my first book here is Hidden Systems, and it is about the internet and electric grids and water systems and how these infrastructures were built and how we think of them, um, sort of as well as the history of them. Hi, I'm Brianna Lowenson. Um, my book, Ephemera, came out from Fana Graphics in March. Um, it's a dreamy um, graphic memoir about um, about like childhood and memory and how you can't quite remember how things happened um, and about my relationship with my mother. And then looking back, um, and it sort of like goes back and forth between looking back at it from a child's perspective and a mother and a grown up's perspective and sort of what happened and how things were pieced together and looking back for trying to figure things out. And there's a lot of plants. <laughs> Hi everyone, um, I'm Wick Taylor. Um, I'm not sh quite sure what my last nonfiction <laughs> thing was, but I'll just say Harry Tubman Towards Freedom, which I, I wrote um, and Casimir Lee drew through um, Little Brown Young Readers, um, biography, obviously. Um, and then I'm currently working on um, The Greater Good, which is a public health history graphic novel uh, drawn by Joyce Rice for First Second, which should be coming out in 2025. Yes, thank you all so, mu so much for that. And as you can uh, hear from just this selection, this is a wide breadth of different types of non-fiction comics, which leads me directly into um, a first question. Um, how did you all pick your subject matter? Like, what made you pick these things to decide to devote a lot of time and energy for and just, like, work on? Um, I will say that uh, people often ask me like how, like how long did it take you to research this or whatever, and I'm always like, well, like my whole life kind of like, um, <laughs> so like like He Man, like I've been interested since I was like five, you know, and then like later on as in adulthood got into it for a really long time too, and it's not it's often like you're 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 kind of slowly researching for the book for a long time before you realize that you've been researching for a book. You're really just like f following your interests. And that's what I do anyway. And then, and then, you know, at some point, there's something that stands out. They're like, oh, this, this is the book. This is it. But meanwhile, you're also researching like five other things that you don't unconsciously, you know. <laughs> Get on in there. Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, usually uh, when I'm doing a nonfiction project, it's something that interests me, something that I want to learn more about. So it's like a, a means through which I can do that, um, or often a topic where it's something that might be kind of complex or dry, and I like the challenge of trying to like translate it into comic form. Um, for Harriet Tubman, um, I, CCS actually reached out to me about uh, writing it, um, and I. I I was kind of intimidated because Harry Tubman's kind of like a, 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 a tricky <laughs> person to write about. They're, they're almost like a, a myth at this point. So like having to go and actually like research her life and find out all these things that actually had never been taught in school was actually, was pretty fun. What was yeah. one of the like most shocking or like rare items you found about her? Um, I, I just learning about her injury um, when mm -hmm. she was, um, you know, uh, in a store and um, an overseer who was intending to actually hit a runaway slave hit her in the head and she suffered a temporal lobe injury, this is what they think at this point, which mm -hmm. led to 
seizures and a lot of re religious um, religiosity and things like that that were a big driving force um, in her work. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I can I relate to what we were saying about just like sort of using comics as a way to learn about a topic that you want to learn about. Uh, for me, in my book, it started off as being really interested in visual metaphor and specifically the metaphors that we use to talk about the internet, like thinking about it like in information superhighway or a cloud or a series of tubes. And I was like, oh, it'd be fun to draw those, right? And it might help us examine like this weird language that we use to describe it. And then I was like, well, how does the internet actually work? And then I realized I could kind of make comics about comparing how we think about something versus how it actually works, how it was built and the kind of story of how they came to be. Um, I was just gonna say that, like, <clears throat> I, I found out not long ago. Like, my wife is a, um, uh, um, she processes things by saying them out loud. So, like, I think that's a lot of us, <laughs> right? So, but I never, I didn't understand. I'm like, why is she saying this? But so, but it's a way to process it. Is like to say the words, or whatever. And I often think that, like, when I'm making comics, it's like my way of processing a bunch of stuff that I just read. I'm like mm -hmm. telling it to myself and like teaching myself about it more than anything. Like it's, it's like um, almost like I'm learning it at the same time the reader does because it's like I'm picking up on it while I'm drawing it. It's like how I'm processing the information in a way. Yeah. Wow, that like, that actually leads really nicely to something I was wondering as I was looking at this because I, happen to love looking at nonfiction comics, particularly if there's something that like I never thought I would have any interest in it at all, or if it's a subject I know very little about. Um, and actually, I think three of you have had things in the past published by The Nib, which used to be my go-to for a lot of these things, where it would be like some sort of topic where it's like, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a scientist, I'm not these things, but I'm like, oh, I, now I wanna know everything about this. Are there topics that you thought there's there's no way I would ever make a comic about this, and then it becomes this thing that you are like immediately like once you start, I have to make a comic about this thing. Where you're like, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if I ever thought about making a comic about te Tetris, the video game. I mean, like, <laughs> but Tetris was like obviously a huge part of my childhood because it was like so popular and everything. Um, but it wasn't until I heard the crazy story about Tetris where I was like, oh, this is would make a comic because there's so much like stuff going on in it. Um, uh, but yeah, I was like, would have been like, oh, what's, you know, I don't know what that's, what is that about the Tetris game? Yeah, it was really popular. Right, like there has to be like a tipping point where it's like, this yeah. is interesting to me or like maybe you'll doodle or maybe you'll kind of look into it, but there's something about it where you're just suddenly like, you it like all the pieces settle and you're like oh wait there's a story here there's a book here I think for me that's how it felt yeah. writing this book is like yeah I could have written about my mom for years but suddenly I could see how I could tell that story that would make a compelling story to everyone like outside of my head and not just to me I think maybe that's for me how it felt and was there something that brought that on for you or like a specific moment or like a way of seeing the story that made it feel like it was something that yeah you to tell for me comics? it was Thank you for asking, Dan. Um, <laughs> for me, um, I had wanted to talk about my mother, and mental illness is a hard thing to write about, and it's you know means you have a very complicated relationship generally with that person, and I didn't know how to do it, and um, I always sort of felt sick when I think about even drawing her, um, and then once I. I was just sort of like sketching and I was like, oh, I don't have to make it look like us. I can make it look however I want and tell the same story. And that like suddenly freed it up for me to be able to tell the story in the way that I wanted to tell, which still is for me very much a memoir. It's just in this other manner. And um, to me that like made like a huge, and then everything fell into place and I just like wrote the book like page one to page 200, so just like in a row. Yeah, and I was struck by like reading that and looking at that, that that is a, a largely wordless memoir, um, whereas other things such as Dan's book has a lot of words in it, right? And other th and I was wondering what, do you know what it's gonna look like once you start this project? Or since we're talking about these new approaches to form, 
when does the form start to come into the conversation with this? Like, um, all of you are people that are both writing and drawing these as like completely finished things. Where does, how does that interplay um, happen with a nonfiction subject? Um, for me, I start, um, I start pretty organically. So I start with, um, I need like no pressure. I want to feel like, hey man, back off. Cause like, <laughs> I don't want to feel any pressure. So I start sketching and doodling and trying to like just coming up with some ideas. Uh, my next book is also nonfiction and it's, um, and then I start with like writing out a bunch of ideas, like verbal ideas, like on Google docs. This is not an ad for Google. Um, <laughs> and then, um, once like I can see the first like sketch or doodle that looks good and then I'm like that that's when I can sort of start to see how it's going to come together like oh this aesthetic is going to fit the mood of the story that I'm trying to tell and so for me I write a mood is important when you don't have a lot of words so for me that's really important is figuring out how are these sentiments going to fit the aesthetic that I'm like trying to go for. Yeah and that's a big part of it for me and thinking about the form is like, I might come up with an outline that starts off visual or I start off by drawing it out on index cards and sort of placing it in a row and then making it into a dummy of a book and then like being like, okay, at what point of, am I like starting to get bored with my own book and like, how can I like, how can I make like, that part not how can I make that not, that, that's honestly like what I always go 100%. back to with right, nonfiction yes. comics yes. is just like, I look at a page and be like, how can I make this more interesting? And I'm just like constantly like, you know, rethinking a, a page composition or a layout or trying to think of just like, how can I make this, yeah, more interesting, more imaginative? How can I like really bring something that only comics could do into it or play with like time and scale in ways that like comics I think are particularly suited for. I always yeah. just love when, sorry. <laughs> I was gonna say for, it's different like if I'm just writing something versus uh, doing both, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, I think like one advantage of like being a writer when you're already a cartoonist that, is that you have a certain like perspective <laughs> and, and you, you understand the importance of visual storytelling. So I don't like to step on the artist's toes. Mm -hmm. um, I think that they play just as big a role in, in, that, um, in that storytelling. Um, and when I'm doing it, it's similar to what you were saying, just like I, I, lots of jotting of notes and doodles and, and like quotes or things that stick out to me. Um, just like, it, and then it kind of like, it takes a form like slowly from like outline to, um, you know, text and stuff like that but um when yeah. you write I've, I've never written a comic for someone else to draw and I find that so fascinating do you um or I guess to anyone do you guys um give the artist uh thumbnails because I've heard it all different some with no thumbnails some with some direction some with like full right. draw it this way like I would I've done I did a, a book uh about Vladimir Putin where the writer I was working with a writer it was the first time I ever did that and I loved the way we worked because it was just, he wrote a bunch of stuff in prose mm -hmm. and I just translated it into comics. Oh, that's great. Um, so it was like a lot of freedom and, and um, I think also like, I, there's just something about the, the comics medium that gives you these little things you can do where it's like you're telling, your words are telling a certain story about maybe like a, a broad factual discussion of something and the visual part of the page can have its own little visual story going on where like, even if it's just one page where it's just like, the cat is moving from the couch to like the thing, the, the ottoman and the guy's chasing after it or something, but it's its own little thing in comics that can draw the reader's eye across mm -hmm. the page while it's also telling the story. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's like what my favorite thing about comics is that it has this little visual language that like mm -hmm. you can take stuff that's even like dry, but it's mm -hmm. just funny and interesting because like mm -hmm. you can have the characters emote and using this like comics language that, and these little one two punches of like panel to panel transitions that like keep it mo keep it going and like make it interesting and fun. Yeah, Wait, I'm really interested. Just like like you were saying, sort of as a cartoonist writing for another cartoonist, like if you're providing thumbnails or those doodles that you're talking about as you're coming across things. Cause like, I think we saw that like a lot with a lot of like nib comics too, right? Mm -hmm. It often is like with 
nonfiction comics, like a writer and an artist working together and like creating something that neither could create just on their own. Right. I actually have not provided thumbnails for those two. I, I wrote some like descriptions or like I include like in our shared script, like links to, you know, images or other things for extra reference. And they're obviously, you know, doing their own research as well. Um, but in those, yeah, in those two situations, I didn't do thumbnails. Oh my gosh, um, we're already getting like deeper than I even thought thumbnails, we were going to. Though, yeah. Don't you think that thumbnails, though, um, um, sometimes for me making thumbnails, I wouldn't give them to the artist. Okay. Like when I was writing for, I wrote Rugrats comics for a minute. <laughs> and uh, I would make thumbnails but not give them to the artist and just yeah. be like, because I didn't know how, it helps me figure out how much is going on each yeah. page. Right. Yeah, I think so visually I wouldn't know how I would even propel the story if I couldn't like see it. Yeah. Like, I think I'm a kinetic learner the way you are. I have to do it to learn it. Right, so it's right. Like, okay, that's how it's going to happen. Yeah, like in my mind, um, I would feel like I'd be writing too much. Too much. All of a sudden, you're, when you start thumbnailing, you're like, oh, yeah. They can't say an entire paragraph in panel one. <laughs> like, or have just, seven lines each. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it just can't happen. Like, it's just, you have to. So, so that, like, helps a lot to even just get you through the story. Mm -hmm. Where I always say that, I'm like, I, like I, when I would try before I started making comics, I would try to. I was like trying to write, like in my twenties, whatever. And I was like, I could never get from the beginning of the story to the end of the story. I would get like halfway through and lose it or whatever. But comics, like, was the only thing where I could like get from beginning to end. And like, uh, so doing thumbnails is so helpful in writing, where then you're like, oh, it's this. You can visually plan out mm -hmm. how it's going to work and how much goes on each page and how much time you have left to tell the story and all these things. This is actually a wonderful segue for something. another question, which is, um, I think, as a student, I was always like, uh, how could I ever finish writing like a, like a research paper that's 10 pages? But now <laughs> as like an academic, I like research and I get more books and more books, and more books, and I love the research project, and I'm like, I have to read all the papers about this one subject <laughs> to do this. I have a thousand sources. Um, when or how do you decide, like, okay, I know enough to write this, and then also how do you, how do you edit then of something that is like a, non, a, a nonfiction story? Yeah, that, um... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like you're. I, I think like a lot of part of a lot of the research is like collecting stuff, right? And then you get to this point where you're like, okay, well, this story, part of the story, I'm, I'm gonna tell. Who else told the same story? Mm -hmm. And then you find this other mm -hmm. thing. Oh, this is their perspective. Oh, this is their perspective. Oh, this was also portrayed in a movie you watched, so you like watch that or whatever. And. Yeah, it is all, it's all collecting. I don't know. I think at some point then you, you, you have to synthesize it all and then make it into your own thing mm -hmm. somehow. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just lost my train of thought, so someone else, please continue. I mean, mine's about my uh, mother, so there wasn't like a ton of research about her mm -hmm. on the internet that I could find. <laughs> <laughs> did you do research? Did you? So did weird. You? I did Google her, and it's like literally nothing about oh. her. On the did you oh. do um, like you know, uh, photo, looking at old photographs? I, there like are that. very few photos of my mom. She's a real interesting case. But I did research a lot of plants, um, and that yes. was really fun. Mm -hmm. I just actually did an interview with, like, a plant club about it, which was really uh -huh. fun to do. Um, so every plant, like, every single leaf on every single page is, like, a individually different drawn leaf or stem or flower so that was super fun to me um, I love gardening but like I would look up like the root structure of this plant because it wouldn't make sense that another one would grow here if the roots grew yeah. like this or like which has nothing to do with the story you guys <laughs> like, yeah, it's literally funny. no reason to be doing this to myself um, which is something I find myself doing a lot in my comics I'm just like why are you doing this um, so for me it was like researching plants and like um, it would kill me if I felt like I had to draw a plant that was like, but they grow in leaves of five, not leaves of three, or something <laughs> like that. Um, so for me, it was this like plant research, which was just like pure joy and fun because I just got to pick the ones I wanted to. I always draw. do that with like clothing when I'm yeah. looking at clothing because yeah. it's always like era specific clothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'd be like, oh, what did they? And sometimes it's like, you know, cavemen eras or something like that, and you're like, oh, well, what did they wear in like? This fur didn't exist. BCE, and... <laughs> yeah, yeah. You have to, yeah. And then you're like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh, that's not historic. It doesn't really matter. It's like one panel of a comic that's like a metaphor. I but know. like. <laughs> but when it feels like a lie, it feels like a lie. Yeah, exactly. I'm gonna make sure it's correct. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, another recent one I did was um, a, a mini comic called Montana Diary for Silver Sprocket. And it was kind of a hybrid, like, travel log, but also, like, it, it delved into some of the historical stuff um, in, like, you know, uh, northwestern Montana and a lot of stuff around, you know, Manifest Destiny and all that, that stuff. So it was, like, it was a different experience to kind of weave in, like, you know, just being on the road with my husband and then, like, having to go back and, like, look at all of the history of, like, the Lewis and Clark expedition and all of that stuff. And I, I think that was, like, that was one of the most fun pieces to make because it was just, like, a, a new experience for me. Um, and the, the public health one, on the other hand, is just, like, so research heavy and so dense and it's like the, the scariest thing is when you're doing a topic and you're like oh I actually know nothing about this like I thought I knew yeah. about it but now yeah. there's so much more and you have to know like when to say when to you know yeah, that is yeah. Me. You're yeah, yeah it was it was a bit of that but like for that the question of like when do you stop which I've thought about a lot and it, like the answer for me is that I just like don't really start or stop the research right it's like yeah. like Vox was saying earlier like it's something I've kind of been thinking about for a long time and I'll start researching it and I won't really stop until like the book is like done and written because it's just like different phases of research there's like reading popular histories to see like what is like the public's understanding of this and then like maybe reading more academic or more specific works to find like what is like on the cutting edge of this research. And then there's visual research. And then even like after the book is like mostly drawn, I'm still like talking to people oh, yeah. and hoping that I don't learn anything <laughs> well, new. Yeah. You I know, know. Like, yes. and there's just like, like uh, I'll talk to an expert and I'll not say. learn anything new and I'll be like, oh, thank, thank God. you. <laughs> like, you know, like, yeah. so that like the last phase of Nothing research. Nothing that contradicts what you've already right. done. Yeah, but that's yeah, still, yeah. it's still really important to be doing yeah. that research at the very end of the project just no, to make totally. sure that like, you're checking your understanding and making In the sure. editorial process, yeah. always, where I'm like, oh, I didn't, there was no edits on this, but after I finished this, like, six months later, I had this thought about it and be like, oh, yeah, I can, now it gives me an opportunity to, like, change this part where it wasn't historically accurate for two seconds. Like, <laughs> you know. It is like that, though, because you're... When you're researching something, right, like... At first, you're like, oh, I know a ton about this stuff. And then the more you learn, the more you learn about how much you don't know about something. And then you, it's like your confidence goes from I really know a lot to I know no. nothing. Yeah. And the more you learn about it. And then, then you have to like slowly build yourself back up to a <laughs> feeling of confidence where you know something. Mm. But, but it's always that beginning part where you think you know it and you realize how much you don't know. Yeah. And it changes, oh, sorry, oh, no, more, it sometimes changes Please. the trajectory of the story, right? Where you're like, I had this whole summary written, and then you get to this certain part where you're like, oh, oh, shit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then That's it's wrong. like, oh, well, I have to figure something else out for the next chapter. Yeah. Because this whole thing just changed. This yeah. is like a dream panel where you all are act, talking to each other and asking questions. <laughs> that like it's, it's it's been wonderful. So I'm I'm just really excited, um, but also wanted and I also wanted to know, does the subject matter and having this learning process, um, where it sounds like it's very in some ways like humbling, does it change the approach to like how you approach doing the actual drawing? Like, are there things that you learn that approach, like, that change, like, even a style of drawing or the way you even approach a page? I would say always, anytime I do any book, that when I'm done with the book, I have to go back and change a bunch of stuff from the beginning of the book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because, like, you get into your rhythm, but not in the beginning. You don't have a rhythm. And then you go back and you're like, oh, I drew the character different for the entire <laughs> book, except for page one, two, and three. Uh, so that always happens. That's just like a guarantee. Yeah, and I think for me, if you look at my book, it was drawn over the course of like four years, and I didn't even, like my drawing style changes so much in it because like in order to keep myself like interested, I'm sort of following what I'm developing in a sketchbook practice or in an illustration practice, and I'm like, just trying, I'm like growing as an artist and like as a cartoonist through it. And there was just like no way for me to go back and make, yeah. <laughs> like it would just be an endless process if I had to constantly be revising the You chapters. could do it forever if yeah. you really got into it. Um, yeah. But it, it ends up, I think, working with the narrative of the comic because like I think the comics actually get better as the book goes on. Um, and like I'm developing my sort of approach to looking at these topics. Yeah, and another thing is just like also thinking about uh, who your readers might be, um, the audience that you have in mind, and like 
I've been thinking about that a lot too with like um, doing comics uh, or in health, public health and health communication because you don't you can't like assume somebody's level of health literacy. Um, there's a lot of stuff that, that we don't like discuss or, or talk about a lot. Um, so like I, my last comic for the Nib was actually like a up. I, I had done a comic in 2000. 18 called uh, America's Not Ready for a Pandemic. <laughs> and we know how that went. But um, I did a follow up uh, was like two weeks ago or something like that, um, just about like where we are with the pandemic and everything. And I had to be very mindful that like I want to talk to like a basic audience and try to make it as like simplified as I can, but still give it a little bit of um, a little bit of detail. And I think that the visuals also, like I, I keep that in mind too, like when I'm, I'm drawing for those comics to try to make them as simple as possible. And then to add any additional context into the, the art itself that, so that my, I have more efficiency in my, in my text. I think that um, what you're saying about thinking about your audience is so important. So when I wrote this book, I was just like, basically writing it for myself, but it really is intended for adults. Like my eight year old read it and I read it to him really intensely so he cried, but I, <laughs> it's like generally it's like meant for adults. Um, but um, the next book I'm working on is about my time in high school in the 90s and it's like told through passing notes and I'm like, oh, I kind of feel like this could be a YA book through Fanographics, which I feel like will be like a really fun, weird way to do a YA book. And so <laughs> my style is totally different because it's much more lighthearted. Not that this isn't lighthearted drawing, but it, it's like, it's very tender. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I just think that the, I is totally, I love to switch up my drawing style anyways, but like it's a completely different drawing style to address the fact that it's like, this is, I want to reach like people who are interested in teenage lives of the 90s who might be in their 40s now potentially, or teenagers now who all look like they're in the 90s anyways, because I'm a high school yes. teacher. <laughs> so. uh, I often, when I, I have a comic strip that I do weekly about cannabis legalization, and I'm always like, who is this strip for? <laughs> Like, because I'm always like, is it for people that are curious about cannabis and want to know more? Or is it for people that are totally involved in cannabis and are, is it for the experts or the new people? And like, it's somehow for both of those people. Yeah. But it's like a weird and difficult, like, place to, to be where you're like, every time I try to explain an, an, a, 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 like a, a, a complicated concept, I have to remember that there's people reading it that don't know any jargon at all. Yeah. So you have to be like, oh, this is, I can't just be like, use any abbreviation mm -hmm. like, or anything like that because I want, to I want to make sure people that know nothing can come to it and walk away with something. Yeah. What's know? the response to your strip and like, who are the people who you find are, are most So um, it's a lot of, uh, obviously cannabis users, but, um, <laughs> but it's a lot of industry, tons of industry people, because it's a, it's a criticism of the industry that it doesn't exist. Like there's no, there's no criticism of the cannabis industry really, because there's no outlets for it for writers, mm -hmm. because all of the cannabis outlets are funded by the industry. Um, so nobody does it because there's no money in it, but I'm like, ha ha, <laughs> there's no money in comics, but I do it anyway. I'm so, already making no money. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, so, but I'm like, I don't care. I'm just going to do it anyway. I don't, I just, cause it, it, honestly, like I get so mad about it and the comics make me feel like I'm like relieving that pressure. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, uh, but it is interesting, like there's always people that are new and they're like, oh, I just they got a dispensary in my hometown or whatever and like this is all new to me. And, but there's also people that have been in the business for like 30 years that are like, oh, I'm getting something out of this also. So like I feel it's hard though to, to keep those two in mind. Yeah, they're pretty at odds. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was, when I was, again, when I was, like, looking through everyone's things and also thinking about, like, non-fiction, because non-fiction um, comics in general are just, like, my jam. That's, like, the most, um, probably the most read thing in comics that I have. And then I was, like, it really is kind of amazing that people will spend, like, you know, sometimes years working on sometimes what is, like, a niche subject. And then I was, like, I wonder why I'm so attracted to that. And then I was thinking, oh, 
I'm an academic that like did grad school that like wrote this like long thing that people are interested in, but are like probably honestly no one's going to read that. Um, versus comics where this is also a niche thing that maybe there's also right. not very much money in, but there is at least a chance that people will read it one right. day. But it's yeah. so important. Like it feels yes. so. It's so wonderful. There are people. Out, you know what I mean? Like maybe there's not a, a, as many people that that play Roblox, <laughs> but <laughs> there is a lot of people that identify with this stuff, and, yes. and, and this is the medium that we all love, so. Also, I mean, like, I, there's, even in the past few years, just seeing the growth of, like, graphic medicine, for instance, and seeing just, like, how many types of people it brings together, um, it just shows, like, how much potential there is, you know, for this, so. One question that I have that I've been thinking a lot about in terms of nonfiction comics is like, um, like I teach a comics history course and I'm always thinking about like things that we kind of consider outside of comics history that are actually like really influencing comics. Like mm -hmm. I think a lot of my work was influenced by like a lot of 20th century um, picture books and like Virginia Lee Burton and like um, these people that were like thinking really creatively about page design in a way that like comics of the time weren't. And I was curious like what, if you all are bringing in things outside of comics into like the way that you're thinking about approaching the form with nonfiction. Yeah, like all the time, like all the time is like, so like, uh, in my work always um, is all this research or whatever, but also there's shit in there that's just stuff that I was thinking about that day mm -hmm. at the moment when I was drawing. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's just like, Creeps it in, and that that can be something like The Sopranos, <laughs> or you know, like um, documentary film a lot, or just like literally anything that's going on up there can somehow be like, oh, you know, what? that actually is kind of like the He Man, of He Man for some reason, you know, and it, yeah. and it it gets in there, and it's really like, I think that that's like the best thing is to pull shit from all over. And not just like publishing from other comics or, you know, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I feel like I definitely watch a lot of movies, especially while I work. I like to yeah. draw and watch movies. Um, so movies for sure creep into my books. And then I read a lot of just not like regular fiction novels and that will happen too where I'll start because I do a lot of writing outside of what goes into the books. There's very few words in my books, but I have a lot written about every book mm -hmm. and I definitely like start basically writing a little Wes Anderson story or something like that where I'm like, mm, what are you doing now here? Like a film, almost like a film treatment, yeah. but yeah. for yeah. a comic, It's yes. really just taking someone's idea. Yeah. I, I always write like a summary out before I start working where I'm like, this is how the story is going to be. It's like whatever, four to 10 pages or something. And I'm like, this, I'm going to follow this exactly. And then at some point I stop even referring to it at all. And then the book's done and I look back, I'm like, I did it's nothing yeah. like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like I went in so many different directions. Yeah, docu documentary film was also like a big influence for me. Um, I've always really been to that podcast, obviously. Um, what else? Uh, I love like scientific medical illustration, botanical mm -hmm. illustration. I'm not saying that actually factors into my drawing, but like it's it's uh, something that drives. Um, I've always like been really uh, drawn to. Also, randomly enough, like reality television is an, is another <laughs> thing that I find to be uh, interesting. I think Harriet Tubman was also into reality TV. Yeah. <laughs> Well, reality television, it can be like episodic documentary. <laughs> it doesn't necessarily have to be, but also sometimes it's very fun that it, it's the worst <laughs> thing ever. <Yes. laughs> that um, actually leads me to um, asking about what nonfiction comics, maybe ones that you all did not create, or ones that you maybe consider pivotal or um, essential reading or things to that like people should know about, especially if maybe they're not ones that have like hit real big. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. Well, I was gonna say Durf's um, comics and, yeah. and Durf's comic about Dahmer, I think specifically because it was so unique because he mm -hmm. like went to freaking high school yes. with just Dahmer yes. and he happens to be this comic artist also. So it was like a totally unique look at at the thing and and it, and I remember when the, he published it as like a 
a 30 page comic like mm-hmm. in the 90s and it is like the whole story of Dahmer in this 30 pages and the book is ex- it's just the whole thing expanded um, but it is unique in, in the way that he tells the story because it's a story for real and not just like this you know listing of facts or yeah, whatever it's not it's the like Wikipedia unique, article yeah of, exactly yeah. it's like a totally unique take on it and, and like I think that like even in, in 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 a lot of the work that I did, I would include personal stories in it, um, where I'm a little character in it, or like a, a, a I remember in the Andre, in the both the Andre the Giant book and mm-hmm. the Tetris book, I included my grandmother in it, and like these little personal stories, uh, you know, to take to make it unique. You know, it's a unique take on a subject that anybody could could write about. Um, yeah, I think for me, especially coming from like thinking about political cartoons, like uh, realizing the sort of potential for comics essays, I think seeing um, some of Sam Waldman's work early on in the nib, like the sort of a way of having like kind of a panelist scroll comic that can explore an idea um, was really formative for me. Um, and he has a full graphic novel out now called Our Members Be Unlimited. That, um, that I love as well. Um, and I think, yeah, other people working in that form too, like Sofiano or Ben Passmore, um, seeing how they're taking comics and like kind of making an essay, but in a way that could only be done in comics, not just like writing an essay and illustrating it, but like mm-hmm. creating, like having two historical figures meet and debate ideas, you know, right, is like something that could only be done in comics and something that like Ben Passmore has done. Um, so seeing that kind of thing, I think is, it was, um, there's a lot of that going on. I'm always looking for like, what is unique to comics in that way. Um. I would definitely recommend every person in this room getting a book called Family Style, which came out um, just this year in June by Tin Pham. Um, and it's his family story of immigrating to America from Vietnam in 1980 when he was a little kid. And like the boat crossing over the ocean and it's all told through his memories of food. And it's just like the most gut-wrenching and joyous and... Um, incredible story in the way that he weaves food throughout and weaves like humor and caring and then this like whole sense of family is just I just can't recommend that book enough. I, I would say um, I mean I'm, I'm biased but the nib has been very uh, <laughs> I think important just um, I've also like had the chance to be an editor there I actually worked on Ben's uh, piece yeah which is uh, but um, when I was a kid, like too, I had trouble focusing on prose. Like I would just mm-hmm. sit there and read it over and over and over, and it just like wouldn't stick. But there was something about like nonfiction books, things that had like um, larger text and, and and drawings and things mm-hmm. like that that would just like draw me in. Um, so like another early one was like Larry Gonick's like Cartoon History of the Universe. Mm-hmm. I'm reading that to my yeah. kids right now. Yeah. 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 It holds up. It's I, so I love those. Like those were like so. Um, so big for me. And there's there's another one that I recently read. It's from for a second. I can't remember the, the creator, but it's about the history of like desserts. That was another one that was like pleasant. It's like very um, colorful and like cartoony and bright. Um, and it's just like a really fun, fun read. And it shows you like all the different, like you can cover like so many topics with nonfiction comics. It's just that's so exciting. Yeah. There's a strip yeah. that I read that's called on Instagram. That's like Four, it's like a very simple four panel strip. It's called the mini ADHD coach. And like, oh, yeah. you know I love about? that one. It's like my favorite thing because it's, I learn about myself. Through <laughs> like, and it's always like this very simple concept and very simple drawings or whatever. But like, it's something that I would not, I've bought books about this type of thing and I've found them. Impo- and it's like important for me to read. And like, I'm just like, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> okay, I need it to be a comic. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I think we figured out the secret of why these yeah. are so appealing. <laughs> um, that, let's see. I have a million questions and limited time, uh, but I think I want to make sure that we have enough time for people that have um, questions. Uh, I wanted to know before we ha- ask people to line up for questions, though, if y'all could talk about like. What is your next project, if you are allowed to talk about said next project? Like, what kind of subjects are you exploring, and where, um, like, where are they going? Yeah. Um, so I have a, a weekly comic strip that I work on all the time. It's ongoing. 
I'm also working on a fiction book right now, um, which is different than I'm used to working on. Um, obviously, I always think that like the uh, work, not working on fiction and nonfiction together are helpful because um, you know working on fiction it helps you figure out how stories work. And so you, when you work on your next nonfiction book, you're like, oh, I see this pattern of a story. Mm -hmm. And also when you're working on fiction stuff, you can pull from real life and be like, oh, the, you know, I don't really know where I'm going, but what would actually happen in real life? Oh, this already happened. Oh, I could throw this in there too. Uh, uh, so like I find them to be like, um, like, it's almost like I feel like necessary to write a story, to learn how stories work, to know how stories work every once in a while uh, when you're working on nonfiction. Um, yeah, so in my book, uh, initially it was going to have a fourth chapter on like waste and recycling, but then uh, the book got too long as it is, and I was like, this could be a whole another book. So um, I've been thinking about how to approach another book, and I really do like the idea of looking at kind of the life cycle of objects, um, how things are made and sort of moved around the world, and what happens to them afterwards, because I think it's like... It's like a way of seeing, right? That if you can like take an object and like you can at once picture it as it is and as it was when it was like raw materials and as it will be when you're done using it, right? Like that's actually like a very powerful thing to like maybe push back on some of our consumerist impulses or just like to kind of see the hidden costs like involved in everything around us. Um, so I, I have no idea how I would structure that into a narrative, but I do think it's something that like comics could be very good for, and I want to like explore how to approach that. I was just watching Grumpy Old Men last week, and <laughs> Walter Matthau was a TV repairman, and I was that made me think about how few things we now get repaired. Repair. I know. Yeah. And, I, and I don't want to be like, well, it used to be so great. Like, I don't mean it like that. <laughs> no. I just thought, I think in terms of waste, I think that that's such an interesting thing. Like, are there things that we can get fixed that we did, like, that I don't know that I can just fix it instead when of I was, buying a new one? I would love to. When I was that. working on this toy book, too, I was just thinking about how wasteful, like, toys in general are. Mm -hmm. Like, when I buy, so the thing to me that is the most wasteful piece of shit is Play-Doh toys. <laughs> well, so like, Play-Doh yeah. itself is fun, right? Yes. But the Play-Doh play sets are just like molded plastic mm -hmm. nothing at all. I mean, it's just garbage. <laughs> and like, and I think about like how, it's just plastic. It's just a piece of plastic that probably costs like 10 cents. And it's all marketing that gets you to buy this thing and it's in a box and all these different stuff. Also, in dealing through this, there was a series of television show cartoons, toys that were about the environment in the 90s, so like Captain Planet, mm -hmm. and there was all these Captain Planet action figures, mm -hmm. and now I think to myself, like, how many of these unsold Captain Planet <laughs> action figures now are living in the giant plastic <coughs> island that's like, floating in the Pacific Ocean? You know, he's holding them up. He's, yeah. he's, yeah. he's, he's, he's collecting them all. <laughs> um, my next book, I talked about it in a second, but... Um, don't tell anyone, you guys, because it's not officially announced. I'm <laughs> only telling you guys. Um, but I have a book coming out with Fanographics, um, and it's about high school in the 90s. Um, and I'm yeah, we excited about it. So I saved all of my notes from high school. Did you guys, did anyone here ever write notes? Anyone yes. Yes. Of course, yes. Okay, I made a, I made a, two kids write note to, notes to each other in class the other day because they wanted, one kid wanted to gossip with the other one and I was like, write him a note. And then I like, <laughs> made him like fold it up and hand it to him and he started to answer. I was like, no, you have to write him back. Go and then go to his classroom. Anyways, I think I've let it infiltrate my life too much. But I think it's going to be pretty fun. It's been really fun to work on. Um, I started like an Instagram account called 90s Town High School where I've been having people submit pictures from the high, from high school in the 90s. So if you have those, submit some. <laughs> that's um, awesome. But that's been really fun to research and work on. And um, uh, yeah, so that should be coming out as soon as I can finish it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm a you know, public health book, um, 2025. So um, I'm also serializing a fictionalized, it's, I mean, it's based off of true story, but it's fictionalized. Um, about a girl working at a um, alternative rock college radio station in the 2000s, um, and so I have some minis of like the first, you know, uh, chapter or so. But um, I, I fictionalize it also because dealing with bands and musicians and all that stuff, I just kind of wanted to, you know, um, have some more privacy <laughs> around <laughs> the real stories. So. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, and 
we have some time for some questions if everyone will. There are two like microphones in the back if people want to like line up and yeah. Um, and I guess I'll awkwardly call on people. <laughs> okay, yes, to my right with the um, baseball cap on. Yes, yeah. hi. Uh, thank you all so much for speaking. Um, I have like a history background and I've written like a couple of research papers on different topics. So I just wanted to ask, how do you diversify your sources and can you uh, diversify your sources? I can imagine with the memoir, it could be difficult, but maybe interviewing relatives or friends from that time could potentially add more insight. I just, mm -hmm. I'm just kind of curious yeah. about your sources. Um, when I was working on the Andy Kaufman book, I was really trying to do as much as I could via first person interviews. Um, obviously, there was a lot of stuff that I had to fill in otherwise as well. But um, yeah, I always try to do as much interviewing with people as I possibly can that are still alive or like other scholars I'll talk to as well. Like um, when I was working on he this book, the He-Man book, I talked to uh, people that studied commercials and like, uh, there was a woman that was like on the front lines of the children's television activism, you know, that type of thing. So that's really, that's my favorite thing to do is first person because you're definitely gonna get like a unique story. Um, in terms of memoir, one of the things that I am really interested in is me is the idea of memory. Um, and so for like the new book I'm working on, the notes don't always line up with what you're seeing. So you'll see like some comic pages and then there'll be a note and you're like, that's not. <laughs> to be happening here. Um, so I do like, and also like every one of my high school friends has a better memory than me. So I've been asking them lots of questions and, and that has been really interesting to hear like what different people's perspectives are and how that can change and who knows who, what's right. And just in terms of uh, memoir, not facts. Yeah, I mean, I pull from a variety of, of sources, but um, one thing that's been challenging is like, just how inaccessible academic journals can be when you're trying yeah. to find things, and like, unless you're tied to like an institution or have some special in, it's just like I find that to be problematic sometimes. Which, yeah, like, which just email me. Yeah, I, my sister's you. a professor, and I'm always don't, just like, get just me this. Don't tell my job. <laughs> Noted. Yeah, yeah no, so that, that happens true. all the time too, because you're like, you're finding an article that you're like, well, this might be about what I need it to be about, but I'm not even sure because I can't look at anything right. unless I subscribe to this thing for $300 yes, a year or something. Yes, it's, and it's ridiculous. Yes, institutional access. Well, that's a whole other thing that I'll be talking about probably over a cocktail later. Yeah. Um, uh, can I have a question from the person on my left with a, I cannot see anything because of the light, but no, like, a cool, like a cool droid shirt. Yeah. <laughs> Hopey droid. Um, oh, okay. I had a, so I'm an academic and um, I've turned to doing comics as a way of sharing research more publicly across different uh, communities. And one of the things that we encountered was, you know, we write text and we might quote people in our texts, um, but when we're actually critiquing them and we're putting their face to their words, it feels a lot different. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, in the nonfiction field, that you're working in, if you've you know, represented people, if they've commented on those representations, if you have certain feelings about when you're representing real people in these stories and how you, you, know, how you deal with that, do you check in with them afterwards? Do you get their approval? Like, yeah, it's just really just wondering how do you, how do you deal with that, which is different than fiction comics. <laughs> yeah, I, so I've... I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I'd say I've run into situations where, um, so like sometimes you're illustrating a scene where you're like, I know these two people talked, they had to have talked about this thing before they did it, uh, but I don't know exactly what they said, right? And so you're kind of like making up a little scene. Uh, and, but then also there's sometimes where you're making up a little scene and you know exactly what they said mm -hmm. and you're like, do I put quotes around this text yeah. bubble? And you're not really sure what to do. Um, I always just solve that by adding a note to be mm -hmm. like, this is either this is what they actually said, or this isn't. This was a, this is like a, you know, a dramatized version of this thing. Or yeah, no, that's difficult. Whoever asked that question, that was a good question. Yeah. <laughs> oh no. Oh. Mm -hmm. 
if you if you don't have anything else to add, I can I can yeah, we'll go to another question. Yeah. That's yeah. totally fine too. Um, to my I guess right with the black shirt on. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Um, I'm right now. I'm a college student, and I'm interested in doing nonfiction comics. And I was just wondering, um, how is like the process of getting a nonfiction comic published different from fiction? If y'all have experience with both, and like if it's with the pitching or the editorial process, or like is it that different? It's so pretty similar. Um, the one difference is that you could your elevator pitch is much easier. <laughs> um, because you have there's a lot of touchstones where you're like oh it's about so you know this right well it's about that part whereas when you're doing a fiction thing it could be like they have no frame of reference at all and you have to give them the entire you know summary of what the even the world they live in is like and things like that you might want to think about like who you're what like look into publishers and like what type of books they publish and kind of gear if you're like oh okay i know for a second publishes this way or i know abrams publishes like a lot of this stuff so that could help you kind of decide and look at what books they put out that might help you figure out like what you want to do um that's the only thing that i could think of of like how a publisher might be different there's yeah. also more websites, I think, that are... I'm seeing more and more um, comics journalism online, mm -hmm. so um, mm -hmm. I would yeah, check this out. Yeah, it's really in incredible. I mean, just over the past 10 years of being in this field, just, like, how much... Um, how, like, the reception to doing graphic journalism, um, like, like, I see it everywhere in major newspapers and magazines, but also just, like outside of traditional publishing, like local nonprofits wanting to like get across their mission statement in like comics or some sort of visual medium. Like I think that there's there's a lot a lot of awareness that it's a very useful thing. And a lot of times it just takes like reaching out to someone and saying like, I think this might be a good fit for you. Would you be open um, to this kind of thing? Yeah, we're also seeing just to add like it with even within academia, um, people that have research funds and grants are allocating part of their funding to getting like a short, like couple page thing, yeah. like made by a cartoonist that explains their research mm -hmm. like as a, as a comic abstract. I've like, done a few things like that. Yeah, graphic abstract. Yes. And those always look way better than like someone's weird academic poster or like <laughs> anything else. It's like so much more like engaging and just also just beautiful in ways that I think people don't realize that research can be. Um, yeah, but we have, I think we definitely have time for a couple more questions, right? Um, to the left in the floral uh, shirt. I'm curious about, since drawing and page layout and all of that is a form of research, have any of you all discovered something that people had not noticed or understood before? Um, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm glad that you said that, though, because it, that is 100% the case where the drawing, like, I, so, like, I did this book about... Vladimir Putin, right? That was written by an, somebody who's an expert in Vladimir Putin. But that doesn't mean that I did no research because I did tons mm -hmm. of research be, being like, oh, what does this look like? Mm -hmm. What does that look like? Where are they? What's this? Who's that person? What's this look like? Yeah, so there is a ton of research just in the drawing of it. Yeah, and I think like in the type of work that I did too, just like... Um, being able to picture how people might imagine things, I think, like allows people to see things uh, in a way that they're like they might be talking about without realizing that they're creating those like mental images for people. Um, I guess that's a different kind of maybe outside of the realm of research, but I do think it's still like an interesting revelation to people. I guess. Um, we have, um, yes, oh, to the right, Hi. yes, yeah. okay, go ahead, yes, um, thank you. Before my question, I just wanted to put in um, uh, a word for the Library of Congress for researchers. You can go there and use their computers, get access to all the academic journals, take your thumb drive and download it. I mean, I went there recently and also just to ask a reference library and I said I needed to look up something in a Poughkeepsie phone book from around 1970. <laughs> And I said, do you have anything from 68 to 72? And 15 minutes later, he comes back with five phone books from, <laughs> from 1968 so cool. to 70. So it's a great resource. And before I ask my question, what was the nonfiction book that the two of you mentioned? You said Brianna's reading it and went... Oh. Uh, oh. 
Cartoon History of the Universe. What is it? Part two, Mystery of the Universe. Cartoon History of the Universe, uh, Larry Gonick. He's done a oh. bunch of different, like, yeah, cartoon that's like guys. classic. It's like yeah. from the 80s. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but yeah. it's okay. still, like, it's like real great. It's very yeah. relevant. <laughs> still, okay. yeah. it's, it's still mostly accurate. It's a little problematic at times yeah. sure. now okay. from right, our right. lens, but it's, it's, it's great. Okay, so yeah. my, my quick question is at the end of nonfiction books, I've sometimes seen a lot of text. Mm. And people put, like, you know, timelines and such. Mm -hmm. uh, do you mm -hmm. do you do that? Do you do you like that, or Citation. does that help? It's usually no. It's notes usually that are like your site talking about what you're citing, but how it was weird in a way because it's yeah. like comics. Because it's like a not. There's no like shorthand for some of the ways that in which that you use text or whatever a specific source in your book. Or you might have wanted to, to make a better story, have to kind of fudge it a little. So you might be like, I remember in, in uh, Gene Yang's book, Dragon Hoops, there's mm -hmm. this p panel where his wife kisses him on the forehead and then in his notes, like she would actually not have kissed me on the forehead. <laughs> right. like, you, like it's just sort of like why this story might actually just need a little bit of fudging and then, right. and then to feel honest. I think sometimes yeah. cartoonists... A hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. I, I really love this topic actually because when I was trying to figure out how to cite things in my book, I was like, I looked through dozens of nonfiction comics to see like how do people do this? How do people cite? You know, like uh, you don't maybe use footnotes, and it didn't seem like there was any sort of con like conventions for it. So this is like for people interested in nonfiction, and if you're doing research, this is a great topic to look into. Like how can we like cite things in nonfiction? And I started to be like, why don't I cite also like my artistic influence? Influences, right? Like if yeah. someone when does it stop? If someone, <laughs> but yeah, if someone yeah. like if a cartoonist developed something like formative in the comics language, like maybe I should cite them for that use of the form. Um, yeah. And I ended up like, yeah, I, I just thought it was like very interesting, like the different things that you might cite in comics that you wouldn't cite in like an academic yeah. paper. And I then remember, the notes are like longer than. And then, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's so many pages of notes I remember in that book. Working, <laughs> working in the Tetris book and and being like, there's no handbook for this shit like I don't yeah. I'm like at some point being like halfway through a page and being like having a panic attack and being like am I doing this correctly I have no idea like I'm just <laughs> making it up like I don't I think this would be the right way to do it but who knows like yeah yeah. Yes. So the um, the Harriet Tubman book was like is part of a historical series. Um, each you know each one focuses on a, a different person. And so like part of the format for those in the back is to have panel notes where like mm. they would ask you to select different panels like that might have a certain detail. For instance, there was one where this couple was jumping the broom. So like this note was on like what that meant historically for like you know slaves to get married and things like that. So I thought that was a cool a cool way to like provide more context on, on certain things. Yeah. Yes, uh, we have time for one more question, but I just also have to add, I remember when like um, Wit, um, Wit and Hazel Nulevent were working on I think Comics for Choice, yeah. and that has a pretty extensive like bibliography in the back of it, but I remember being sent that bibliography from, um, by Hazel and asked like to put it like, can you just like put this like in the format like that it's supposed to be <laughs> for like academia? And I was like, but there isn't like one, and then they were like, what? And I was like, yeah, like this is fine the way it is yeah. <laughs> already. Like this is fine. Like there's not, there's many different citation styles and many different things that people choose to or not cite. And many, also many people that are arguing over like what's the actual right yeah. thing. So I think that that's really interesting. I do that really same thing to my sister. My sister is a professor and I always, and being like, is this right? I mean, I don't know, can yeah. you do this you, for me? Yeah, Help you, are, me. you are the authority. So yeah, it is right the way you're doing it. Okay, a last question. Thank you. Hi. Um, uh, my name's Melanie. I'm also an academic. I wanted to say, if you ever want a research paper, the corresponding author or just about any author will send you a PDF. That's true. In like that's half well. an hour. <laughs> yeah, that's oh, true well. as well. Yeah, that's true as well. Because awesome. they don't get because they don't get paid from whatever that is that they have the thing oh, wow. on. So it doesn't matter. Yeah, just email right. them and they'll send it to you. They'll oh, probably wow. send you three other things related to it too, oh, wow. and want to be your friend. Yeah, We're very that. lonely. <laughs> that's happened. Thank you. Yeah, I've made, I've made Thank friends. You. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I write grants to try to get money to make the things I to publish, and I think everybody should try that, writing grants uh, to get, you know, to whomever, what, you know, biology or the foundation for um, water pipes. Um, but what, what, what would always help is evidence that presenting information in this format has helped, that the public knows this fact about Harry Tubman now more. Like, have any of you done that research? Do you have 
a bunch of research on showing effectiveness of this method? And if you do, could you share it with them? <laughs> <laughs> Only a bunch of people saying, I loved this book. Yeah. Or, yes. like, I learned so much from this, but uh, that would be great data to have, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, how many people loved it? <laughs> yeah, show of hands. Yeah. And it's hard because like I think a lot of the things that like you get out of nonfiction comics are like hopefully like, oh, this helped me see things in a different way, which is not something you can quantify with the data generally unless you're like it's a more qualitative, I guess, response. But yeah, maybe having those emails is uh the way to prove it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there are like, um, studies done, for instance, with like health education, comics, and materials like that, and looking at how that might have affected behavior and things like that. I mean, that definitely exists. I just don't know, have any specifics to give you right now. Yeah, yeah. well, I know that one thing that maybe people do is sometimes, I, I make a point to use comics in my classroom, even if the class is not specifically on comics, and I make a point to say that, that those comics are used within like a college classroom, mm -hmm. and that's something that I know some cartoonists will like add to there, but I don't know about like effectiveness or anything like that. Um, that said, I wanted to thank everyone. We are like at time, and I don't want to keep everyone here forever, even though I could talk to this group <laughs> forever. Um, I know that the floor is closed, but several of them have books right here on hand that you could buy said books, but also all four of you, if you all will be here tomorrow, will be tabling tomorrow as well, so please support them, buy their books, but thank, I want to thank you all very much for the wonderful discussion. Yes, and thank you all, audience. Thank you.